Well, good morning, Wesleyan Community Church. We have been studying for quite some time now the life of a 9th century prophet who lived in Israel by the name of Elisha. And by now, if you've been with us, some of you are probably wondering, how long are we going to be studying Elisha? The answer to that question, if you count this week, is two more weeks. Uh, we're going to finish up the, the life of Elisha uh, next week, and we're going to be looking at our own lives and kind of taking a look at what I would call a life of significance, something that God desires for us to live, a life of significance. And so this week, we've been, uh, again, we're, we're in Elisha, and we've been looking at his ridiculous faith. And how God used this guy again and again. God showed up in his life and God did some crazy, crazy things. And we've been looking at the characteristics um, that, of faith that Elisha's life kind of shows and that we can learn from his life. We, we've learned about obedience, commitment, love, trust, provision, determination, transformation, humility, recovery, sight, and about God's favor that he desires to pour into the life of those who follow him and those who have faith. This morning, if you have a Bible in your hands, I would invite you to open it with me to 2 Kings chapter 8. If you have a smartphone, you can flip there. There should be a Bible in front of you in the pew. We will also have it on the screen for you this morning, 2 Kings chapter 8. Sometimes in life, multiple events occur simultaneously, and they seem to strangely coincide with one another. We call this phenomenon a coincidence. Maybe you've heard of this story. In 1975, there was a 17-year-old boy, and I may mispronounce his name. It's a little strange, but it, his name was Erskine Lawrence Eben. And Erskine Lawrence Eben was riding a scooter down Middle Road in Hamilton, Bermuda, when he was struck by a taxi driver named William Manders, who was transporting a passenger at that time, and he was killed. The crazy part is, is that almost exactly a year later, Erskine's brother Neville, who was now 17 years old, was riding the same exact scooter down Middle Road in Hamilton, Bermuda. He was struck by a taxi, which was driven by William Metters, and was carrying the exact same passenger and was also killed. Crazy, crazy coincidence. Our story this morning includes a very interesting coincidence that occurred during the life of Elisha. I would invite you again to read with me 2 Kings chapter 8. It says, Now Elijah had said to the woman whose son he had restored to life, Go away with your family and stay for a while wherever you can, because the Lord has decreed a famine in the land that will last for seven years. The woman proceeded to do as the man of God said. She and her family went away and stayed in the land of the Philistines for seven years. At the end of the seven years, she came back from the land of the Philistines and went to appeal to the king for her house and her land. The king was talking to Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, and had said, Tell me about all the great things that Elisha has done. Just as Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had restored the dead to life, the woman whose son Elisha had brought back to life came to appeal to the king for her house and land. Gehazi said, This is the woman, my lord the king. This is her son whom Elisha restored to life. The king asked the woman about it, and she told him. Then he assigned an official to her case and said to him, Give back everything that belonged to her, including all the income from her land from the day she left the country until now. This story tells the story of the same Shunammite woman that we read about in 2 Kings chapter 4. She was the, the woman whose life characterized ridiculous determination. And if we kind of rewind our minds back a little bit to 2 Kings chapter 4, this Shunammite woman lives with her husband, and they probably have um, a measure of means. They have some, some money and some finances. And they become aware, the Shunammite woman especially, of God's prophet Elisha and how he commonly passes through their area. And so she goes to her husband and she says, what we ought to do is we ought to make space for God in our life. We should build a, a room for Elisha so that when he's passing through our area, he can have a spot to stay. Elisha, again, is overwhelmed by, by her generosity and their generosity, and he asks his servant what can be done for them, and he says they have no son. So if you remember, he goes to the, the Shunammite woman, and he, he says to her, you're going to have a son, and she's kind of like, no, I don't want that. I didn't ask for that. that. That would be everything I want, but I'm not even seeking that, and he says it will happen. 
God gives her the son, but the son, as he's a young boy, is out in the fields, he gets a headache and he dies. And then we read the story of her ridiculous determination that she is going to pursue God. She chases after Elisha with everything that she has, and she almost forces his hand to say, I am going to pursue God with everything that I have. My situation is dire, it is dark, it is heartbreaking, and I am going to take it to God, and there is nothing that is going to keep me from seeking God in my situation. And Elisha eventually comes. He, he comes to her house, and God, through Elisha, brings her son back to life. It appears in this story that Elisha is still looking out for this same woman. We don't know exactly how long it's been from that story, the healing of her son, to this story uh, in, in 2 Kings 8. But Elisha is warning her. There's a famine coming. The land that, that we live in is going to experience a famine. Go to the land of the Philistines that is near the sea. There's better water. There will be better food. You can live for the next seven years in the land of the Philistines. During that time, it's likely that according to law, her land probably reverted back to the king. And whatever land she and her family and her husband had owned would have gone back to the king and the ownership would have belonged to him. Also seems likely from our story that at some point while she's away or, or while she's going or maybe even before she ever leaves, her husband probably passes away. We know this because when she gets back, she is the one dealing with legal matters. She is the one as the woman going before the king. She goes to the king and it just so happens that the moment she walks in the door to see the king, the king has been sitting there and he has been listening to Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, tell stories of God, tell stories of how God has moved through Elisha's life. And it just so happens that it was the exact story of this Shunammite woman that the king was listening to at the moment she walked in. And the king is so moved by the story so moved at the hand of God and how he has looked after this woman and her son that he grants back the land and goes a step further, providing for the prophets of the land in their absence. There's three things that I think God wants us to learn this morning from this story that we could call a ridiculous coincidence. This Shunammite woman appearing before the king at the exact moment that he is listening to stories about her. And the first thing is simply that it, it's not just a coincidence. It's not just coincidence. Some coincidences in life, some of the things that we go through, we probably could say are actually more appropriately termed divine appointments. As we read this story, we just can't miss how God seemingly orchestrated the events within it to provide miraculously for this Shunammite woman. God has intervened in her life time and time again. He's provided a son, He's revived that son from death, warned her of a great famine, allowed to her to return her land, and paid the wages needed for her family to survive. This may have been even especially important if you take into fact that her husband has probably died, and her son may not quite be of age yet to take the land. So not only do they now get their land back, but God has provided for them finances until this son would come of age. During the sermon last week, we talked about these uh, times as only God moments in our life. Times when what could have happened or what should have happened turned out differently than what we expected and the credit can only be attributed to the hand of a sovereign God who is orchestrating the events of our life. Our church is a part of a denomination known as the Wesleyan Church. We are an orthodox, evangelical, Protestant church born out of the holiness movements within the broader stream of Methodism. That's a whole lot of big words in one sentence. We get our name from John Wesley. John Wesley was the founder of Methodism. He himself was a, a preacher within the Church of England, the Anglican or the Episcopalian Church. And John was born in 1703 as the 15th child to his parents Samuel and Susanna in Epworth, England. When John was five years old, his father was a preacher and he lived inside the parsonage. And when he was five, their parsonage caught on fire. And everybody in the house was able to get out of the fire except for young John. At five years old, John was trapped upstairs as the fire raged throughout the house. The stairway to get down out of the house burned down and the roof had caught fire. 
two laymen who were there got up to the window and one of them climbed on the other one's shoulders and they reached inside the window and they grabbed five-year-old John Wesley and they pulled him from the upstairs of that house just before the fire caused the roof to collapse and the house to be uh, reduced to rubble. Wesley would later recount the story and he would quote from Zechariah 3.2 referring to himself as a brand plucked from the fire. Today, the number of people who are a part of churches within the entire broad stream of the Methodist tradition totals more than 80 million people worldwide. The saving of John Wesley was kind of one of those only God moments, meaning that the only one who was really in control uh, of those moments is God. God was moving and orchestrating the events of his life, believing that he had called John Wesley to a specific purpose, that the revivals that Wesley and Whitfield would be a part of, the broad stream of Methodism that we get to enjoy being a part of today, that he had something he was doing to advance his kingdom. Many people in our world will chalk circumstances that happen in life and history up to nothing more than mere coincidence. But it is faith that allows us to see what these things are. The sovereign hand of God intervening into our world, causing events that seemingly are unrelated to orchestrate together like a conductor of an orchestra saying, now the strings, now the brass, and the orchestra hits, and the music goes. The problem with divine appointments is that they are only God moments, right? means only God is in control of them. We can't cause an only God moment to happen. We, we can't make a ridiculous uh, coincidence occur. We can't ha cause a divine appointment. And that could leave us wondering, well, what's our responsibility? Do we have any responsibility at all if God is the only one who can bring about the outcome? What is our role as his people? And while we may not be, any, be able to do anything to directly cause God's hand to move, I think our role is to prepare, to prepare ourselves for what God may want to do. Much like as a parent, there are many times where we don't know what our kids are going to do. We don't have complete control. We can't cause them to do certain things, but we can prepare ourselves. What is going to happen? Eventually, they're going to move out of the house, and maybe they'll live close, or maybe they'll live on the other side of the country. And I must prepare myself for what is going to come. How do we prepare for divine appointments and only God moments in our life? Two things that I'd say. The first is be available. Keep yourself available for divine appointments. In our passage this morning, I think that Elisa's uh, servant Gehazi was a perfect example of this. We see Gehazi in, in 2 Kings 8, 4 and 5 telling God stories to the king. And the passage doesn't give us a whole lot of background. It seems, it seems likely that this is probably King Jehu who, who has come into power. King Joram, we know, had lots of interactions with the prophet Elisha. And so it's probably King Jehu, and he's this new king, and he's come into power, and he's kind of heard that there's this guy, and he lives in your country. His name is Elisha. He speaks on behalf of God, and these ridiculous, crazy things keep happening. And Jehu, the new king, who's kind of in charge of this land and all these people, is like, I want to know more about this guy. And so he calls for the servant of Elisha. He calls for Gehazi, and he says, come to me. Come share with me. What have you seen? What have you witnessed? What has God done through this life of Elisha? The last time we read of Gehazi, he wasn't exactly in a good place. We last read of him in 2 Kings 5, 27. At that time, he, he had deceived the foreign dignitary Naaman. He had gone after him and he had spun this tale so that Gehazi could get personal wealth and that he could gain from what Naaman had. He sought not what God wanted, but what he wanted. And Naaman was stricken with leprosy as a punishment for his sin. And we're never exactly told whether Gehazi was repentant for his actions or not. But we maybe have a clue in the fact that here, he is allowing himself once again to be used by God, simply by being available. There's nothing really extra special that Gehazi does here. 
That there's no special movement. He doesn't throw a stick to make an axe head float. He doesn't lay on top of a, a child. All he does is he comes before the king and he says, you want to know about Elisha? You want to know what God has done through him? Here I am. Let me tell you. It appears that at least this time he's not so self-seeking, but he talks about his master and how he was used by God to bring somebody back to life. When I was a, a youth pastor, we used to take trips um, a couple times a year up to the Wesleyan colleges, and, and this was one of my favorite things to do. It was a lot of fun to visit Southern Wesleyan and Indiana Wesleyan. And, and usually when we got on the campus of Indiana Wesleyan, one of my favorite things to do was to walk students through the student center, and I would point to this spot within Indiana Wesleyan University. This is um, inside the student center commons, and you're looking in at the dining area, and this is a spot of the dining area called Teeter cafe. It's just kind of a, a well-decorated spot named after one of the old, old dormitories that's long since been torn down. There's nothing extra special about the table that sits there, nothing extra special about the spot. It's just kind of a neat spot for people to eat lunch. But why I love to show people is because this is the exact spot where a punk-haired, skateboard-riding ministry major met a very beautiful young business major who had transferred into Indiana Wesleyan on a September afternoon in 2002. This was the spot where I first saw Christia Marie Niles and my heart leapt out of my chest. Unfortunately for me, hers didn't quite do the same at that moment, but only God. Only God's stories. I share that with you because the table didn't do anything. It didn't do anything extra special. It was there. One September afternoon in 2002, there was a place called Teeter Cafe, and it was there. But in my life, it is a very significant spot. Just by the virtue of the fact that it was available and God used what was available. Sometimes I believe that the most important thing that we can do for the kingdom of God is simply to be available. Sometimes the craziest only God stories, the most insane divine appointments, the, the ridiculous coincidences that happen within God's kingdom happen just because God's people make themselves available to be used by God. In leadership circles, Christian leaders will often say that they're looking for three qualities in somebody who can have great impact on the church and the kingdom of God. We believe often as leaders that what God is looking for in somebody to be used for his kingdom is God is looking for somebody who is fat. Now that doesn't mean somebody who, who eats too much pizza and ice cream and doesn't exercise at all, but it's an acronym that means faithful, available, and teachable. Faithful, if somebody is going to be used by God to do great things for the kingdom, they have to be somebody who is consistent and reliable. Somebody who lives up to their word, and when they say they're going to do something, they follow through with it. When they say they're going to be somewhere at a certain time, they show up at that time regularly or early. When they're given the opportunity to participate in kingdom endeavors or when they have other options that may seem more worldly and fun and enticing, they consistently choose God's kingdom. God looks for people who are teachable, meaning if someone is going to be used by God, they have to be able to learn. God has a hard time using people who have everything all figured out. That's why Jesus didn't call his disciples from the ranks of the Pharisees and the religious teachers. When Jesus came from heaven to earth, he didn't go to the temple and the synagogue to choose his followers. He found fishermen and tax collectors, people who knew very little but were very willing to learn much. It's very hard to mold clay that has been through the kiln. But clay that is fresh can be molded to for it a variety of purposes. And God's kingdom needs people who aren't set in their ways, but are willing to continue to grow and adapt as the situation and context requires it. And as it relates to our story this morning, God is looking for people who are simply available. Being busy is nothing new. Being busy is nothing new. Jesus himself, in Luke chapter 5, verse 59, he's recruiting a disciple. He's talking to somebody, and he says, I want you to follow me. And this person says, I have family matters to attend to. And Jesus says, let those things deal with themselves. As for you, follow me. 
I know you're busy. I know there's other things that you could do, but I am calling you to make yourself available and to follow me. Often I think this might just be the most important quality that God is looking for. Somebody who will prioritize the kingdom of God and simply be available for God to show up in their life. The tricky thing about being available is that it, it doesn't mean that every time you make yourself available, that God's going to show up and do something crazy and miraculous. Not every time that you show up for church is God going to rock your socks off with a worship set. Not every time you come early to an event and you put out chairs doesn't mean that there's going to be a dramatic result. Sometimes not much at all happens. Like a couple of weeks ago, we had this great event. It was going to be awesome, and, and we had planned it, and we had prayed for it, and, and we were going to provide lunches to the, the families as Harnu School let out on their first day, and, and we were excited, and we were ready for it, and we were available, and we were prepared, and God let it pour down rain all morning, and our event was canceled. <laughs> but if we aren't available and the regular and the mundane, sometimes we'll miss out on the great opportunities of what God wants to do. I think of this kind of like dating your spouse. If you're married, you have a responsibility to pursue the heart of your spouse. You need to plan regular scheduled times to romance them, to talk to them, and to show them you are still precious to me. We didn't just date and get married and that was so many years ago or months ago or whatever, but you still matter. And I still want to take out and carve out time just to be with you. Now, the truth is, especially for us, I know, there, there's times when we carve out this time and we have this scheduled date time and we go on a date and it falls kind of flat. You know, we, we may go to a coffee house and it's one of our favorite things to do and we're sitting there and we, we get coffee and we find ourselves talking about church stuff again. <laughs> or, or, or we may decide, hey, we're going to go to a movie and get lunch and the movie's just kind of, and the lunch is okay and the waiter screws some stuff up and it just kind of sort of happens. But then there are times where we do the same thing. We schedule the mundane activity. I, I can still remember this one time. Um, before we had Jillian, when we lived in, in Tampa, we went to this salad bar restaurant and kind of showed up a little bit early for dinner. And, and, and we had nothing special planned. All we were doing was going to a salad bar place. And we sat down and, and somehow it just turned into one of those evenings where we ended up spending like four or five hours at a salad bar restaurant until it closed just talking and connecting and falling in love with one another and just having this fresh sense of our connection with one another because something happened and we were available and we were consistent with it. Frequently, I think that one of the greatest things we can do to grow our faith and experience God's miraculous power is just to be available for him to use us. And a great place to start is where Gehazi found himself in this passage of scripture. Just be willing to share with others about what you've witnessed God do in your life. You don't have to worry if you get every detail perfect, every theological explanation uh, quite spot on. God's Holy Spirit is with you. It's within you. He will guide you as you speak. But simply make yourself available to share the story. And you never know what divine appointment or only God's story you may be walking into. And if you're a follower of Christ this morning, just ask yourself, aren't you grateful for the times that God's people who went before you were available and they shared with you the stories of how God moved in their life that blew your mind and expanded your faith with awe and worship at the power of God in people's lives? We need to be available. And the second thing that we can do to prepare for God is to be proactive. We can be proactive enough to ask God to bring divine appointments into our life. This is what the Shunammite woman did. Again, I don't think there's a lot of context that scripture gives us in this passage, but I don't envision her coming home from the land of the Philistines, coming into Israel, looking at her land, and just kind of having this cocky attitude of, I'm going to go talk to the king. He's going to give me my land back. But I picture this woman coming back home to Israel and she's got her son. There has been famine. Her husband has died and she is going, I have no idea what we're going to do. I have no idea how God is going to provide. I can look backwards and I can know that God has provided in the past. I know that we owned land 
And I know that that land belongs to the king now, probably. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go talk to him. Before I go, I'm just going to get on my knees and I'm going to say, God, I don't know what you want to do. I don't know whether you're going to give me my land back or not, but this is all I know to do. So God, I ask that you would go before me. I ask that you would open up a way. I ask that you would be with me. I ask that you would be with my family. I pray that you would provide for us, God, in a way that only you can. It just so happened that when she walked into the room, God had already been preparing the king. Elisha had been there talking, or excuse me, uh, Gehazi had been there talking to Jehu about Elisha and about how the hand of God had moved and the king was listening to this story and he's listening to the powerful hand of God and how this God had used Elisha so strongly that he could bring back a boy who had died to life and the king is at this like, whoa, God did what moment. And at just a moment when the king's mind is just exploding and he's like, seriously? A dead boy back to life is crazy. And the Shunammite woman appears in the back of the room, and Gehazi's like, Jehu, that's her. That's the girl. That's the woman who had the son. This is her. And she comes before the king, and she says, King, can I have my land back? We're, we're, we're back, and I don't know what to do. And the king grants her request. And not only her request for land, but he says, all of the money that the land earned for the last seven years while you were gone, I'm going to give that back to you. See, the king was gracious with the land, but according to Jewish law, eventually the land should have gone back to her family anyways. If you know Jewish law, you know that in the year of Jubilee, that land eventually would go back to her son. So the king was gracious. We don't know when Jubilee was. It could have been the next year. It could have been 40 years. But he was giving her back her land, but not only that, providing for her financially. The Shunammite woman had no idea how her situation would turn out, but she decided to trust God and take a step in the direction of faith. And sometimes that's all we can do. Trust God and take a step in the direction of faith. Whether you're seeking his provision in your time of personal need, whether you need a touch from him in your physical life, whether you're burdened by the cares of your family and friends, whether he's calling you to do something and to be an active participant in his kingdom, when he lays on your heart somebody to pray for or to share your story with, when he leads you to give of your time and your resources. Sometimes God, usually God, doesn't tell us what's at the end of the road. He desires us to be people of faith, people who will be proactive and take a step in the direction that we feel he is leading us. Every year about this time, if you go outside, you will witness that there are large flocks of birds. And these birds are leaving the north and they're heading to the south towards winter. And science would tell us that these birds do this on instinct, that they know that the days are getting shorter and that they have a better chance of receiving food supply south than they do in the north. And at the risk of over-spiritualizing bird migration a little bit, I think these birds are a perfect example of what it means to go on faith. They can't know what the journey is going to hold for them. Many times birds die in the migratory process. They don't know what they're going to find when they get back to Florida this year. Is their habitat still there or is it a condo association now? <laughs> but the thing these birds know is that there is something within them that prompts them, that calls them, that says the time is now for you to head south. You may not know what your journey entails. You cannot know what lies at the end. But faith calls us to be proactive, to take a step in the direction we feel God is leading us and prompting us and calling us. So where is it this morning that you think, that you feel that is burning within you of where God wants you to go? What would it look like for you to take a step even if it was the smallest single step, to take that step in that direction. What is keeping you from taking that step? By faith and the power of our sovereign God Almighty, the great I Am. Only God's stories, divine appointments that happen in life are not merely coincidence. 
if we want to see God and what only he can do, if we want to experience his divine power in our life, those ridiculous coincidences born of faith, it's our job to be available, to prepare ourselves and to be in a spot where God is able to use us, and then to be proactive, to simply be willing to take a step in the direction he leads us. Will you let me pray for you this morning? God, each person in here, I believe that you want to be intricately involved in their life. There is not a man, woman, or child who is in this building today, God, that I, don't, that I believe you are not setting up for, for some kind of divine appointment. There are things you want to do in our lives. There are things you want to do through our lives. There are only God stories yet to be written in the next pages. They're different for each of us. But you love each of us. You walk with each of us. God, may you increase our faith this morning. May you allow us, may you call us, may you draw us, may you strengthen us so that we could be available, so that we could put ourselves in places where you want to show up in our life. And may we be proactive when we feel that we have the burning sense within us of what God is calling us to do, of what we need to do next, of where we need to go in the midst of the situation we find ourselves this morning. Give us the strength and the boldness to take the next step by faith, not in ourselves, but in the power of our God, the great I am, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Go with God and have a great week.